<laughs> After several military assignments, deployments, and having children, she decided to separate from active duty in order to go back to school to pursue her lifelong dream of practicing medicine. Barbara is currently a biochemistry and <coughs> pre-medical studies student. Yep. Barbara has been accepted into and is starting medical school at Alabama College of Osteopathic Medicine in July of 2016, and she will be in the class of 2020. And her topic today is chemistry of essential oils, entitled Experience Total Wellness, Understanding of Essential Oils and their in the other room you have efficacy. Boxes, so. And I'd like to introduce okay. you, okay. Barbara Van Thank you. Um, well, it's an honor to be here to talk to you guys a little bit today. My passion is educating and empowering people to take their health into their own hands. You said it all. I, my goal is to put a healer in every home and uh, make sure that you have the knowledge you need to help yourself. Um, I guess they announced next door that I would be starting in five minutes, so there'll be people trickling in, which is perfectly fine. I'm going to start on time because I am the first speaker of the day, and I want the schedule to stay on time all day. If you need to step out, please do so. Just quietly exit in the back. Um, this is definitely not an all-encompassing lecture on everything you need to know about essential oils. It's just kind of an introduction and a taste for some of the current research and science that supports the use of essential oils. Um, yeah. So I'm going to really quickly tell you how I got into essential oils. When I, when I separated from the military and decided to go back to school, as a medical student, I needed extra help with daycare with my kids, so I hired a nanny. My kid had the flu. The nanny asked, can I put some essential oils on your kid? And I just thought she was nuts. I, I'm like, I really like science, but go ahead, you can try. You can try it. But within 10 minutes, my kid went from laying on the couch super lethargic to running across the couch. And I was like, what did she just do? I took him to his pediatrician and told him, my nanny just put something called essential oils on my kid. What is it? What do you think? And he was just kind of like, yeah, there's you know, more and more scientific research supporting the use of essential oils. And just told me a little bit about the things that he had knew, known, which wasn't all that much. So I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna start researching this. So for two years, I was a closet essential oil user. I didn't tell anybody I was using them because my, com my, compad my counterparts, the, my fellow medical students would have thought I was crazy if I told them, hey, I'm trying out homeopathy and alternative treatments at home. Um, but now I guess I'm a recovering closet user and I've converted a few of my uh, fellow pre-med students, including my organic chemistry teacher and one of my anatomy and physiology teachers who has three PhDs. One is in neuroscience and uh, she studied at the McKnight Brain Center at the University of Florida. So I'm just going to do a quick intro video. Again, if you need to step out, feel free to. I have all of my research and documentation. If you want to talk to me afterward and get some of my sources, I'd be happy to share them with you. Another great source as you do research on your own is clinicaltrials.gov and pubmed.gov. Okay, so we're just going to get going. And thank you for being here. This is an intro video. There are no wasted efforts in nature. The fragrance of a flower the smell of an orange or a scent of a plant tree all serves specific purposes vital to a plant's survival. What our senses perceive as fragrances or scents are actually volatile aromatic compounds, tiny organic molecules that serve a variety of protective, reproductive, and regenerative purposes. These compounds help ward off unfriendly pests, attract friendly herbivores and insects, and even help the plant heal from infection and physical injury.
Um, I'm gonna go back. So you might be here and you're thinking, I'm not really sure if I believe in essential oils or I don't know if those really work. Well, I'm here to today to tell you that they do. And in, in medical science, we're so far beyond the point of whether or not we believe in essential oils. We know they work, it's been proven time and again. Right now, most of the studies are focusing on how they work, um, trying to understand the physiological process. Sorry, uh, I thought somebody was talking to me. Um, <coughs> Scott, can you help me? Right. Okay. Um, but I'm going to need it for other videos, Scott. I'm going to need it for other videos. Okay, so I'm just going to keep talking and uh, can you help me? Um, so far beyond whether or not we believe that essential oils work, trying to understand the physiological processes that happen within our bodies when we do apply essential oils topically or we inhale the aroma. Um, there's one of the slides, if we get to it, it lists 50 hospitals which are currently using essential oils. And I noticed that two of the most notable hospitals that you're probably familiar with are missing. One is Vanderbilt Hospital. They're diffusing essential oils in their emergency room. Uh, Johns Hopkins is using essential oils, these hospitals. There's also one in North Dakota that's studying using On Guard and Melaleuca um, to fight nosocomial infection. Nosocomial just means hospital acquired, so MRSA. Um, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say about that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about plant biology and why essential oils work and how they work, um, and then we'll get into a little bit more of the chemistry behind them. So essential oils are secondary metabolites of plants. The primary metabolite of a plant is glucose. Glucose is its primary source of energy. It needs glucose uh, to grow and to survive and to thrive. So how it makes glucose, it takes carbon dioxide in the air, which is CO2, and it takes sunlight, and it synthesizes a six-ringed molecule that has six carbons, um, which is what this is demonstrating, the glucose at the bottom. Uh, so why would a plant take its primary source of food, what it needs to grow and make, make an essential oil, make an aromatic compound? It must be something pretty important if I'm gonna use my source of food to make something. So essential oils, the function that they serve in the plant is to protect it against viruses and bacteria, funguses, to nourish the plant, to repair it after injury, and also as a source of reproduction. Because plants don't get up and move. So if I, need to, if I need to eat, if I need to protect myself against a bacterial infection, I better be able to produce myself something to protect me. And uh, you know, the birds and the bees, how they pollinate flowers, that's what the reproduce uh, is talking about. Um, so if we're gonna get an essential oil out of a tree, what we have to do is tap it. What we're doing is injuring the tree. The essential oil that's produced, or first um, the resin or the sap, that's what comes out because the purpose of that is to repair the tree, to heal the tree. And at the fundamental level, we're all made out of the same things, whether you're a tree, a plant, a dog, or a person. We have, we're carbon-based life forms. And uh, the chemicals that are in the tree sap also work to regenerate tissues in people. And we can get more into that in a little bit, or if you attend to a class. I only have a a little bit of time, so I'm gonna do this as fast as I can. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a research that's being done right now by the National Science Foundation um, outside of Manitou Springs. They have a huge forest of pine trees. And what they were finding was that during this period of drought, the pine trees were making more of something called alpha pinene. Alpha pinene is a chemical constituent that makes pine trees smell like pine. So alpha pinene smells pine. So it's a period of drought and these trees are producing more and more alpha pinene. And it kind of seems almost counterintuitive to the scientists. Like, if this is a period of drought, why is the tree spending so much energy making this pine scent? Well, what they found was that alpha pinene is a very good antioxidant. Antioxidants bind to free radicals. So they're, you know, releasing the pine scent, releasing the pine scent, binding to free radicals in the air, which now makes a positively and negatively charged molecule in the air. So it's polar. What else is positively and negatively charged? Water molecules. So water molecules are attracted to this complex of alpha pinene and free radicals, and water molecules start accumulating. It starts building storm clouds. So by releasing alpha pinene, the pine trees are signaling it to rain. This is kind of amazing research. In fact, I don't even think the results have been published yet, but if you want to learn more, go on YouTube. <laughs> There's tons of videos about it. The National Science Foundation has um, some videos about it too. It's really neat. So another way that they work, we were talking a little bit about how they work as antibacterial and antifungals. Uh, so in science, we have this term called chemotaxis, and it means, it means signaling through chemicals, through scent. So if, you're, if we were a lavender field right now and that side of the lavender field was being attacked by a bacteria, it would start producing a certain chemical. And that chemical would signal me over here as a plant because I have the receptors for the chemicals that other lavender plants can make. So if you're being attacked by a bacteria, you're gonna start releasing this chemical which is gonna signal to me to start producing the antibacterial necessary to fight off that infection. That way the entire lavender field doesn't get wiped out. 
same thing for fungus. Um, yeah, just you can take that thought to its logical conclusion. So how they work in the human body, we talked a little bit about this. Okay, so our cells in the human body, uh, they have a lipid layer. The inside of your cell is an aqueous space. The outside of your cell, we call this the interstitial space, is a liquid layer. But your cell membrane is actually made out of lipid. And uh, the reason for that is to protect the inside of the cell. We don't want things that we don't want going inside the cell, and we want the things that are inside the cell to stay inside the cell. So water can't cross that lipid layer. Just like if you have a cup of oil and water, the oil sits on top and the water um, is within. So essential oils are lipids. They can cross that membrane. They're also extremely small, which is part of the reason why they can um, penetrate the membrane. Let me see where I'm going with this. Okay, so here's, this is one application. We're going to talk a little bit about antibacterial. I'm going to back up a little bit. So they can cross the cell membrane. Once they're inside the cell, they can actually bind to your DNA and clean receptor sites. They can bind to free radicals. Free radicals, when we talk about things like age-related changes, what we're talking about is free radicals doing damage, oxidative damage to your DNA, to the proteins that are within your cells. So when you take your essential oils and they get inside the cell, they uh, neutralize those free radicals. Typically, when we think of something that's an antioxidant, we think of vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, because they have tons of sites where they can neutralize these free electrons that are roaming around in your cell causing damage. But something that's an even better antioxidant than vitamin A, C, and E is something called polyphenols. And essential oils are loaded with polyphenols, and that's one of their main mechanisms of action. We start talking about tissue regeneration and uh, preventing age-related changes, if you will. Um, so inside the cell, outside the cell. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about antibacterial applications or antiviral applications. Um, so this is a bacteria cell. Back was the human cell. Human cell, lipid layer. Bacteria cell. Bacteria have a protein layer called peptoglycogen, and that's what protects the protein. Um, they can also form something called a biofilm that's equivalent to snot to protect it. The essential oils can penetrate um, the biofilm. It can eat through it, essentially, and it can uh, eat through the protein layer. I, I'm trying to say this in a really simple way, and cause the cell to lice or burst open. Um, but it doesn't do any harm to human cells because we have... Good? Are we okay? No, no, I'm okay. sorry, I was, I was communicating, I apologize. <laughs> um, so they're, they did some research at this. Uh, yep, so bacteria, because they have that protein layer, they can't penetrate a cell. Viruses don't have cell walls, so they can get inside a, a human cell. And essential oils can get in and target that virus as well. Also, pharmaceutical drugs, the molecules that make up pharmaceutical drug are very huge molecules, and they cannot penetrate uh, the human cell layer. We have cell receptor sites on the edge of your membrane, which they bind to, and that's generally how they work. But in medicine, we don't have very many good antivirals, and that's because we have a very hard time targeting a virus because it's inside the cell. But I'm going to show you a quick video, and this was done... Um, Harvard and MIT were doing some research on how we can start fighting MRSA. MRSA is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Now, people, when they typically think of MRSA, you know, think, oh my goodness, this is so dangerous, it can kill you, and it can if it gets deep inside your skin. But the truth is that MRSA lives on the surface of your skin. MRSA lives in your throat. It's part of your normal flora. But if you get a really deep cut and the MRSA gets within you, it can kill you. Uh, what, what's super concerning about it right now is all the best antibiotics that we've had throughout history are not working against it. So it's becoming this super bug that we're super concerned about. So a group of scientists started studying, hey, can essential oils work against MRSA because our antibiotics aren't? So what options do we have? And I won't spoil it, but I think you know where I'm going with this. <coughs> Scott, I might need your help once this is over. So he has his Master of Medical Science from Harvard and MIT. Bacteria have the ability to change their genetic makeup over time for their own self-preservation. Bacteria have their own defensive mechanism. They produce something called a peptidoglycan layer. It's the equivalent of an M&M shell that's protecting the chocolate on the inside. Now, one of the other elements the bacteria are very, very good at making, and that is something called a biofilm. Biofilm is its own very goopy, slimy mess that it covers itself in. So what's now starting to happen is we are finding that once very useful antibacterial medications are no longer effective at all. What that means for us, we have to use stronger antibacterial medications. We have to use more potent antibacterial medications. That comes at a cost to our own bodies. Now, Luca has the ability to come in and 
start to modify that sludge and remove it so that the oregano can go to the bacteria. And in oregano, there's a product called carbacrol. Carbacrol will bind to that peptidoglycan and it punctures a little hole in there. Once that hole opens, you start to get a passing of ions back and forth. What that does to the bacteria is it allows it to lice. It means burst open. And we've now accomplished something very dramatic. And that is by doing nothing more than using two simple little plant-based essential oils, you have created a very effective antibacterial solution. <coughs> Now we just kind of talked about this a little bit, so I'm going to skip this slide. They work at a cellular level. They work within the cell. Um, so aromatic applications, this is probably one of the most, I, I would say, prolific ways that essential oils are used is aromatically. And you might be wondering, how can it work? Like, is it all in your head? Like, why does smelling an essential oil trigger a physiological response in my body? Um, so when you smell something, the shape of the molecule binds to certain sites within your, epithel your uh, olfactory epithelium. So that's a fancy way of saying your nasal cavity. Um, from there, it, it signals an um, electrical stimulus response that goes to your olfactory bulb, is an interpreted by, I uh, can't remember the name of it, I'm blanking, uh, your olfactory cortex in your brain. So what's happening is there's a chemical reaction happening in your nose, and your brain is telling you, I smell something. But this chemical reaction also happens on your skin, it happens in your lungs, it happens on your heart. Uh, we just don't have the same receptors that we have in our nose on our skin, so we don't interpret it as scent. Um, it's also uh, very intrinsically tied to your memory. Sense of smell will uh, help you to recall strongest memories, help you to form memories. Um, I don't remember where I spent that. Um, your sense of smell is intrinsically tied to your ability to remember. So when you smell something, you'll recall memories very powerfully, more strongly than your sense of sight, your sense of hearing, your sense of touch, your sense of smell has the strongest ability to form memories and to recall memories. In fact, this has been known by teachers for quite a while. In fact, in grade school, I had teachers who would hand out peppermint candy when we were studying and then again when we were taking the test because that smell would help you recall the uh, material and there's tons of research being done on that and besides peppermint rosemary is another really good one for uh, recall um, it's a little bit just about the physiology of how it works in your brain so your sense of smell is also the fastest way to your brain um, partly because it's right there but another thing is how fast uh, the chemical receptors transmit signals um, so when I smell something and that smell binds to a chemical receptor, it's going to start a cascade of reaction. So if I smell a property that binds to a molecule in my nose that communicates to a portion of my brain that signals it to either produce more hormones or less hormones, that can signal it to produce uh, anti-inflammatory benefits, that can tell it to speed up my, digest my digestion, digestion. And this is a terrible example, but this is one of the best ones that I can think of. People really start relating to why your sense of smell um, is so important is there's a group of people who've known this for a long time. Scientists are just starting to understand it. In fact, in 1994, somebody just won the Nobel Prize for understanding, hey, our sense of smell and like how it works and how it's triggering our brain. But prior to 1994, there was a group of people who knew, hey, the fastest way to my brain is through my sense of smell. The fastest way to get high is by snorting cocaine. And when you do that, it changes, it literally changes the chemistry of your brain. When you smell gasoline, when you smell an essential oil, when you smell these chemical compounds, it's literally changing the molecules, it's changing, uh, the chemicals that your brain is producing and you know that's part of the reason that people get addicted to doing things like drugs. Um, so I talked to you a little bit about some of this, the 1994, the chemistry Nobel Prize. This is just, I just want to show you the source article. So this is the New York Times, this was back in 2011 and what this article is talking about is how we have the receptors for smell not only on our skin but it says, you know, we have these odor receptors located throughout our body. They're in your liver, in your heart, in your kidneys and even sperm. 
In fact, this is some really incredible research. Whenever somebody gets pregnant, it's a miracle. We have no idea how the sperm is able to find the egg, but what they've started to find is it's the same process of chemotaxis. The egg releases a chemical that can bind to the sperm, and so the sperm is able to find the egg through essentially sense of smell, because sense of smell is so much more than, it's a series of chemical reactions. So something else that this article is talking about in the New York Times is how they did an in vitro study of damaged tissue. So they essentially had a Petri dish with human tissue in it that they had injured intentionally, and they started diffusing uh, sandalwood oil next to it. So this wasn't even, it wasn't touching it, they didn't apply it to the skin, they just diffused it and let the aromatic compounds that were in the air, because this is a process called diffusion, so just the aroma, just the, the chemical constituents being in the air caused the tissue that was near the sandalwood to heal seven days faster than uh, without the essential oil. And they're doing research right now with helichrysium and post-op patients for plastic surgery, and they found the same thing, that post-op patients who use the helichrysium to help repair that tissue are able to go home between seven and 14 days faster. And I mean, post-op, seven to 14 days is an eternity. Um, I think that I am just about out of time, so I, I think I'm gonna stop there. Let me just check my slides, and I'll take any questions that you guys might have, and Yeah, I think I'm good there. We still got about eight minutes before Q and A. If you want to keep talking. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Are you suggesting the medical community is warming up to this seriously? Oh, so you missed a little bit at the beginning. So we'll come back to this. There's tons of research ongoing. I think some of what started. Um, inspiring this research was things like MRSA, when we start getting superbugs that we can't treat with conventional medicine. And so they started looking at alternatives. That video was, you know, Harvard and MIT's research, so I don't know what I just did. I think I just closed the slideshow. Just give me a second. There are over 50 hospitals in the U.S. right now that are reporting using essential oils as um, in their practice. They're diffusing them. They're using them to increase productivity. They're using them for health and healing. Uh, America's kind of slow on this. In Europe, essential oils are being used. They're being used in the Far East. Right now, if you go to medical school in France, an entire semester, so six months of your study, is only on aromatherapy. And in France, you are actually prescribed essential oils for treatment. You'll be uh, prescribed things like lavender for burns or for cuts. For lavender is a natural antihistamine. So they use it for treatment of allergies. They use it for treatment of hives. Um, right now in Australia, that's where tea tree oil comes from. Tea tree, the scientific name is Melaleuca. It's tea tree oil. It grows in Australia, it's the best place to come from the world. Australian soldiers carry tea tree oil in their IFAX, um, first aid kit, I, whatever, military, okay, uh, in their first aid kit, just like we would carry something like a hydrogen peroxide or a neosporin. Um, yeah, so this is the list, also missing from here is Vanderbilt, uh, Johns Hopkins, and uh, I cannot remember the name of the hospital, but there's one in North Dakota that's studying using essential oils to clean catheters and things like this to reduce the uh, currents of hospital acquired infections in patients. So is the medical community warming up? Yes. I mean, the medical community is now way far beyond whether or not we believe essential oils work. In fact, it's always funny whenever I teach a class because there'll be people who say, oh, I don't really know if I believe in essential oils or I would never ingest an essential oil. Well, you do it every day. If you pick up a Halls bag and you look at the back, it says menthol, 8%. What's menthol? Menthol is peppermint essential oil. Menthol is the chemical name for it. It's the active ingredient. So you can take a Halls or you can use peppermint essential oil. So let's talk about something else. In your mouthwash, if you turn over your Listerine mouthwash, it's gonna say eucalyptol, it's gonna say thymol, it's gonna say methyl salicate. Okay, so methyl salicate, fancy chemical name. And you're like, and you know, there are people who are like, oh, if you can't read it, don't use it. Well, methyl salicate is just a scientific name for wintergreen oil. And now more and more products, because they're catching on to the fact that people want these words that they can pronounce, they're actually writing on there, you know, essential oil of wintergreen. Um, Vicks Baby Vapor Rub, same thing, it's got menthol and eucalyptol in it. Um, Icy Hot, I'm trying to think of other ones that we had looked at. Uh, chloroseptic Spray, it says phenol on it. Okay, so let's talk about phenol a little bit. Phenol is a carcinogen. So if somebody's talking about phenol, what they're talking about is a six-membered carbon ring that has an OH group, which is an alcohol group attached to it. Last, the last two words, O-all, alcohol. So that's a specific compound, but there's a class of compounds called phenols, and usually like methyl salicate is a phenol, chemical compound, not the compound menthol. So also if somebody tells you that essential oils contain carcinogens because they have phenol in it, no, 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 not phenol like the compound phenol, a group of compounds, a class of compounds called phenols. They're incredibly safe. Part of the reason that they're incredibly safe is because of the way that our body metabolizes them because they are that lipid and our cells are lipid so it doesn't damage your cells like it would damage a protein cell wall. Um, super safe. What else was I gonna say, Scott? 
Okay. Do you remember anything else I was going to say, Lisa? <laughs> What's the best way to use them? Like to put them in the diffuser or to sure. um, put them under your nose? <laughs> yeah, either of those ways work. If you don't have a diffuser, you could rub a little bit in the palm of your hands and inhale it. That's diffusing. Uh, you're getting some of the same benefits. If you have something going on topically that you're specifically trying to target, like if you want an antihistamine reaction, that's something systemic. So inhaling is just fine because it's going to trigger uh, that cascade of events in your brain and your nervous system will take over from there and your immune system. And essential oils, I'm going to say this, essential oils aren't going to cure any disease. They're not going to heal your body. They're not magic. They're not, they're compounds that support your immune system and your nervous system. So if you're using essential oils, it really is just helping your body heal itself. Um, because your body's going to have to do the heavy lifting. Like we talked about, well, Dr. Stauer talked about essential oils getting in there and fighting the MRSA by eating through the biofilm, you know, the carvacrol, lysing the protein wall, but it's still your own immune system. It's your body that's going to have to flush all that stuff out of your body. So uh, this is just kind of like the tip of the iceberg. Hipp Hippocrates, who's the father of modern medicine, said, uh, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. Uh, because it's super important that you start taking care of yourself at that foundational level of good nutrition to support your immune system, to support uh, your nervous system. And then, you know, we're going to talk about diet and exercise. We're going to talk about stress management and rest and all these things. But the essential oils just help your body do what it does naturally. Um, yeah. You mentioned two websites. Yes. Um, clinicaltrials.gov and pubmed.gov. P-U-B-M-E-D, clinicaltrials.gov, clinical, just C-L-I-N-I-C-A-L, trials, T-R-I-A-L-S, dot gov, and that's the government's repository for all of the clinical trials that are currently going on, and say you're interested in like, hey, I'm interested in whatever the current research is saying about sandalwood oil, because that was the one that we talked about with the tissue regeneration, and then pubmed.gov, there's other research articles, yeah. What, what level are the, most of those articles written at? Oh, yeah, most of those articles are written very much for a scientific community. So if you're going to flip through those articles, there might be a lot of chemical terms. Like you might not see the word wintergreen essential oil. You would have to know that methyl salicate is wintergreen essential oil. I teach tons of classes. This was really supposed to be just a taste. So I'm happy to do one-on-one -on -one consults or come if you want to do a class in your home where we talk about like, hey, let's interpret some of these things like, you know, a phenol, a eugenol, a thymol, and help you interpret some of those studies. So that's a good point. They are written at like the grad school level and they're written for scientific journals. They're not typically written for the layperson, but some of them are. Yes. If you're uh, wanting to go purchase them, what kind of things should you be looking for to find the best ones? You know, they're going to be more potent. Okay, that's a great question. Um, so when you talk about uh, essential oils, there's two things that you're really concerned with. You're concerned about purity and potency. And purity is kind of like a fingerprint. Am I getting what I think that I'm getting? Uh, because there's multiple chemical constituents in one essential oil. Menthol is one of the constituents in peppermint. And something that makes peppermint so much more effective than menthol alone is all of the other constituents that are in there that help your body to metabolize it, help it to work. Just like when you're eating, I mean, we all know this. If you take a vitamin, a multivitamin, it's good for you, but it's much better to get your multivitamins from food sources because you're getting all of the cofactors, all of the enzymes, all of the minerals that help your body to absorb that vitamin. Your body can't absorb vitamin D without calcium. So, you know, maybe you have low vitamin D and you're popping vitamin D pills like crazy. Why is my calcium still low? Why is my calcium still low? No. Why is my vitamin D level still low? It's because you're not getting the calcium that you also need. Um, so same thing. It's a similar concept with essential oils. Um, so potency is really important, making sure that you're purity, getting what you think that you're getting in potency. So uh, something that's very important to consider with potency is that are the oils sourced from the best location in the world? The best lavender in the world comes from France. Um, best peaches in the world come from Georgia. So with essential oils, it's the same thing. And I can kind of give you an example. We talked a little bit about earlier about Colorado Springs and Manitou Springs and how they're doing the studies with that pine trees release, releasing alpha piney. So something that affects the chemical constituents in a plant is their environment. If it's an environment that's you know low water supply, if it's grown in uh, soil with certain minerals, it's going to change the levels of certain constituents in that essential oil. So the best essential oils in the world come from certain locations, like the best lemons in the world come from Sicily, the best frankincense in the world comes from North Africa, from the Middle East. So you could grow it in a clean room in your house, you could make a farm, but you're not going to get the same effect as if it was grown at the source. So those are two things you just look for is uh, the sourcing of the essential oil and um, 
the purity and how you can tell purity. So there's five different tests that we do. We do gas chromatography, um, NMR uh, mass spectroscopy, and there's a few others, which probably doesn't mean a lot to you guys. But if you want to talk more individually about how to tell whether or not an essential oil is a high quality one, I'd be happy to talk to you. There's a few good companies out there. There's one great company, the best company is doTERRA. I've researched it for two years and I can tell you why I believe that, but I'd be happy to help you find a different one or tell you more about doTERRA. Why don't you interpret that and publish it and sell it or give it away? <laughs> that would save a lot. I mean, you know, you can get right into your morals quicker, you know. Publish. Why you doTERRA? Just, uh, an interpretation of all these scientific names into oh. layman's terms. Like yeah, so I have a book that has it that I'm selling at my table. Yeah. So if you walk in, uh, I'm the table in the corner right here, and there's a huge banner that says, Healthy Can Be Simple. And I'll be there with books. And there's more chemistry than you ever care to know in those books as well. <laughs> and I'm also going to be doing classes, so if you'd like to attend a class on how to cook with essential oils, how to use essential oils with your pet, with your baby, with your grandma, we can sign you up for some classes. If you'd like to do an individual wellness consult, we can do that. Um, I do them in my home or in one of my team members' homes, or I'd be happy to come to them in your home. I do one-on-one, -on -one too. If you're not comfortable coming to my home, we can go in the bar. Yeah, I'm local. Um, go out to coffee, talk. Anybody have any other questions? Okay, come see me at my booth. Thank you guys so much for attending.